there's a raw beauty to this time of year, especially on crisp, fresh mornings with that watery sun cutting through the branches of trees and frost rind leaves absolutely everywhere. Brave daffodils, that lovely gold pushing up through the ground. And if you listen very carefully, you can hear it. It's called the rustle of spring. But in some parts of the garden, it's not so much the rustle of spring as the squelch of spring. I was hoping to start planting up this herbaceous border with its backdrop of shrubs this week. But look at the state of the soil. Here am I walking on it. The best thing to do when your ground's like this is keep off it. You can't steal a march on nature if she's producing ground like this, but what you can do is get cracking at making border perennials a cheap way. If you nip down to the garden centre now, you'll find lots of herbaceous perennials like this delphinium in two litre pots. Now they're quite pricey, they'll cost you a fiver, you know, and if you're planting a big bed up, that's a lot of money. But if you look closely at them in a pot this big, you'll see that this plant has four separate stems. We're early enough in the year to be very cunning and turn this one plant into four, tip it out of its pot, and then set about this root system. What you're trying to do is produce, and I apologise to the Irish, what's known as Irishman's cuttings, because they've already got some roots attached. So break away down here. I'll get that leaf off so you can see. And then, you see these shoots here beginning to appear? Don't need all this bottom bit. Oh, he's going to kill it. No, he's not. When you've got a lot of that compost away, from each of these plants, you can get your knife in. And it's a bit like a surgical operation. You want to try and get that bit of stem there out with roots attached. Put it round behind it. I think it's going to manage. Just out it comes like that. Look at that. Lovely. And there is your Irishman's gutting. This is ordinary multi-purpose compost, but into it I'm going to mix some sharp sand. You can use fine grit if you want. What this does is make sure that it's much better drained. Because cuttings, even Irish ones, like good drainage at the stem bases, otherwise they tend to rot. So plenty of that mixed in there. Once it feels crunchy, it's okay. I'm using four and a half inch plastic pots, a bit of compost in the bottom, and then sit you're cutting in. Now take great care to pot it to the right depth. You can see the soil level as it was in the previous pot wants to be fractionally below the new compost level. There we are. And you do that with all four of them. What do you do with them now? Well, if you've got a propagating frame, you can pop them in there for a week or two. That really will encourage those roots to establish. But don't leave them in there for any longer than a fortnight, otherwise the plants will start to grow and become leggy. You can pop them in a cold frame or a cool greenhouse if you haven't got a propagator. But either way, come about May, they'll have turned into decent plants, they'll have filled those pots with roots and be ready to plant out. Coming up, Chris Beardshaw meets Derry Watkins, who's managed to triumph over clay. Joe has got some instant colour. But first, Rachel finds hospitable hosts for clematis. I love clematis, but you soon find that you run out of obelisks, walls and trees to send them up. But with a bit of planning, you can create really successful planting combinations using clematis and existing or new plants and shrubs in your own garden. It's a bit like choosing your outfit in the morning and then selecting a pair of shoes to go with it because there's a clematis for almost every plant. Burford House, the National Collection of Clematis, is really something special and I particularly like the way that it's laid out. It's not so much a case of, oh, there's another lovely plant, almost like a plant zoo. It's more the way that they're used to show the clematis to the best advantage. So here they creep and crawl and twine through a whole range of other plants. There are lots of good reasons for combination planting. You can extend the season of flower for every square metre of garden by using clematis to flower before, after or with the flowering host plant. 
and host plants can provide a backdrop to illuminate and set off the clematis flowers. Clematis enjoy a cool root run, so by planting with a complementary plant, it gives the perfect growing environment. And here's my guide to some winning combinations. Catinus, the smoke bush, can be one of the most glorious shrubs, but on a really dull summer day, it just looks like a sort of blank space in the garden. But if you take a look on the other side, you'll see that it's absolutely smothered in this beautiful white clematis, Paul Fargies. In fact, in this particular case, it's almost too much of a good thing. You can liven up boring evergreens with a splash of gold. Before it comes into its own in late summer with bright coloured berries, Catoniaster divericulatus can be quite frankly boring for much of the year. Clematis tangutica golden tiara with its mid-yellow nodding flowers gives it a bit of zest. Now this is a brilliant idea because although ferns are an excellent plant for foliage and their form, what they're entirely lacking of course is flower colour. So here we're using a herbaceous clematis to grow up through it. Now this is not a clinging plant so it literally just sort of flops into its host plant. It's integrifolia pangborn pink and it's very delicately scented but you have to get quite low down to enjoy the scent because it only grows to about three foot tall. Because it's herbaceous you simply cut it right back down to the base at the end of the autumn and it'll regrow in the spring. This is Clematis texensis princess Diana. It's also known as a tulip flower clematis because of the shape of its flowers resembling tiny tulips. Now it's growing here through a shrub rose, Rosary de la Haye, which is almost finished flowering. There's just the odd bloom at the top in this wonderful deep rich ruby colour. But what the clematis is doing is providing colour after the roses have finished flowering. But we're going to have a third season of interest with these rose hips, which will give us colour into the autumn. So you're going to get three seasons of interest taking us right through the year. For a quieter combination, Clematis Mrs. Cholomney with its light lavender blue flowers adds a touch of sophistication, especially when entwined with the shapely scented pale pink form of Climbing Rose New Dawn. Or you can extend the growing season by growing Clematis through Clematis. Here, an early flowering Montana rubra is followed by the nodding flowers of Bill Mackenzie, which develop into silky seed heads. As gorgeous as clematis are for their flowers, their own stems are pretty unsightly, but here they're lost against the dark green of a formal clipped yew hedge. The large, deep purple flowers of clematis jackmanii poke their way through. Well, you know what I was saying about needing the right shoes. Well, at this time of year, it's just lovely to see something in flower. And I found a beautiful, very early spring flowering clematis, which I'm gonna put here in Alan's kitchen garden. It's got beautiful soil, so I don't need to add anything to it. And this is clematis armandii. And it's got wonderful flowers, which are very finely scented. They smell of almonds and lovely glossy foliage which is evergreen and that's really the big difference. <laughs> now I'm positioning it about 30 centimetres away from the wall. You don't want it too close because you want to make sure that it's not within the rain shadow of the house so in order to get that moisture it's quite important and I've also put it in just a little bit deeper than it was planted in the pot. Now with deciduous clematis you need to do that in order to guard against wilt, so that if they do get wilt, they've got a better chance of regrowing right from the base below ground level. But in this case, I'm doing it simply so that it has a good chance of producing new shoots, also from very low down on the plant. And one of the best things about this clematis is that it's from the group that requires very little or even no pruning. It's quite vigorous, so it can get to about four and a half or even five meters tall. So if you want to keep it under control, then every two, maybe three years, you can take out what you don't need. And if you do want to do that pruning, do it just after it's finished flowering. Do you remember last year, this five foot square between my compost heap and my little greenhouse, I planted up with ferns. They've been absolutely wonderful right the way through the winter. It's the second week in March now, and they're still bright and shining green. So convinced am I that ferns are a great part of the modern garden that this little greenhouse, which is now quite overshadowed by next door's tree, I don't really want to have to chop it down. I thought I'd grow in there ferns which need a little bit of protection, not quite as hardy as those that are outside. 
this beauty's coped in here all the way through the winter and it just had the frost kept off with the heater until the heater broke and then it doesn't keep the frost off at all through February and March but it still survived. It is of borderline hardiness if you look it up in the encyclopedia and its name is Asplenium bulbiferum. It comes from Australia and New Zealand and it's called bulbiferum because it produces little bulbils on its fronds. If you look at down this one here you can see little plantlets beginning to emerge from those bulbils. With all this staging to fill, I'd be a twit if I didn't cut them off and make more plants for nothing. The technique couldn't be simpler. Now, time was when you'd get a seed tray like this and fill it with a mixture of peat and sharp grit. Now, quite rightly, we're much more conscious today of peat conservation. And the good news that's just come out is that most of our peat wetlands in Britain are, over the next few years, being handed over to English nature. They are, if you like, the British equivalent of the rainforest, and we desperately need to conserve them. What it does mean for gardeners is that we have to look to alternatives for peat in the garden, garden compost and well-rotted manure come into play. In the greenhouse, we need to look at compost which don't contain peat, so what I'm using here is a multi-purpose peat-free compost and that grit is mixed with it. Now for something like Asplenium bulbiferum, quite a toughy, it won't mind that at all. And what do you do with this? You pin it down. Now this compost was watered last night with boiling water just to make sure it is sterile, though most composts are. And I now have the huge fun of getting paper clips, bending them into hairpins, then push that hairpin in at an angle of 45 degrees to start with on the midrib of the frond, that main lump going down the middle. Work your way down that so it's really held in place. And then you can tend to the individual fronds so that everywhere there's a bulb bill, you need to make sure that the base of the bulb bill is in contact with the compost. And again, a paper clip will do that for you very easily. It may be Heath Robinson, but it works. When they're all pinned down, you can simply slide that tray into a polythene bag to give it an extra bit of atmospheric humidity. Or better still, you can get one of these plastic domes that neatly fits a seed tray, and it suddenly becomes a little mini greenhouse propagator. Keep it moderately warm but not really hot and soon these plants will start to root down and grow up and when they're big enough to handle you can separate them from mum and pot them up on their own. Before you know where you are your greenhouse will be full of plants for nothing. Our diary this week comes from Cragside in Northumberland. Now they've had everything up there in this last week. Snow, rain, wind, hail, frost. But that hasn't stopped assistant head gardener Alison Pringle from getting out and getting on with her gardening whatever the weather. Cragside's a fantastic property. It's actually carved out of a rugged hillside in the middle of Northumberland. We're quite a long way north, so our growing season is a lot shorter than other parts of the country. I think at the moment we're, we're running about three to four weeks behind. It's an ideal time to sow seeds. There are a great many things that can actually go in at this moment. If you want to sow wildflowers to plant out in the garden, which is becoming very popular at the moment, it's a really good idea to plant them in little pinches and plug trays. The plugs are far easier to plant out, and also sowing them in pinches gives you a really nice natural looking little clump. These white campion seeds are excellent plants for insects, and they'll give a lovely display of blooms in the late summer just pop them into a cold frame or an unheated greenhouse to give them some protection from the winter wet. In the spring, when the seeds have developed into really nice, strong little plants, you can plant them out anywhere you like. Cragside's unique features is its orchard house. Here we grow peaches, nectarines and apricots, which are slightly tender in this part of the world. Because they're under glass, they actually come into flower very early, before any of the insects are around to pollinate them, so we have to do this job ourselves take a little bit of pollen from each flower, transfer it to the next one, alternating between your fruit trees so you get good cross-pollination. Pot-grown strawberries look a bit scruffy at the moment, so take them in, tidy them up, and if they're old plants, they need to be split, divided and repotted. 
There has been a couple of occasions where we've only been frost free in July and August, but we always manage to pull the stops out and overcome these difficulties of the weather, like gardeners all over the country. <laughs> Corners are one of the best plants for the winter garden. They have wonderful stems and a wide variety of colours. The only problem is, which ones do you choose? Well, you don't have to. You can have them all. I've got three different varieties here, and they're the last of this season's bare-rooted plants, which means they're really cheap. They're only about two quid each. Alan's not got great soil in this part of the garden, and fortunately, corners aren't too bothered. They're not fussy about soils, and they're also great for damp conditions. Add plenty of organic matter to get the roots established and give them a really good start. Just look at the contrast in stem colour, they're fantastic. The great thing is I'm going to have that in the ground because I'm going to plant them in the same hole. I'm going to separate them out into colours here. And I'm going to try and plant them quite randomly rather, in, rather than in blocks. So I think I'm just going to start planting. This is a great one. This is Cornus alba kisseringii. Stems start off purple down the bottom and they get blacker and blacker as they go up towards the tips. Really nice plant. This one's called Cornus flavoramia. It's a very, very fresh green stem on it. Almost sort of acid green. Contrasts brilliantly with the black one. And just Fill it. Just get them all in place first so they're standing upright and then I'm going to firm them all in in a bit. This is Cornus alba sibirica and the stems are sort of coral pink at the bottom and they get darker as they go towards the tip. I'm just going to work my way around the hole, just trying not to make it look too designed. I often plant these in sort of contemporary city gardens as well and they look great against a painted wall or a brick backdrop or something. Now every now and then stand back and have a look. Oh yeah, I like that. I think I'll put this last red one right in the middle. Now the thing to do, especially with bare rooted plants, is to make sure you've got lots of soil around the roots and firm them in really really well. So there's no air pockets or frost pockets around them. And just look at that. A veritable tapestry of multicoloured stems. But take a good look, because unfortunately you have to be cruel to be kind. Now this seems like a terrible thing to do, but it has to be done to regenerate fresh growth and to get the best colour next winter. I'm cutting them down to about 30 centimetres from the ground and just above a line on the bark where a new bud's going to come out. And next winter, we're going to have a multicoloured, multi-stemmed, fantastic feature for any garden. And talking of colour, it's about time I renamed that blue border. The blue borders, they've been what in diplomatic circles they would call less than satisfactory. But I need a bit of inspiration. Always good to get somebody else's ideas into your own garden. I want to sort of create that glady, very green, using very small leaf green plants. Nothing too, you know, combative. Just more, just very cool, calm space. I think that's wise because of this oak tree, because there's so much shade over here. Yeah. Particularly this side, it stays quite dark, and even over there it's getting it. So, more reliable, I think, with green. Yeah. What about the boundaries? I'm not fussed about them. I mean, that withy fence is beginning to fall to bits anyway. It won't <laughs> last another season. And the thing that had the hanging baskets on, that can go as well, so I don't feel strongly about it. Th I thought I might put some vertical posts in, and because with this space you either walk down it or you walk up it, uh, we could paint the one side one colour and the other side another colour, so as you walk down you see one colour, and as you walk up it's a completely I different like feel. Do you know, it's funny, I feel like a client. <laughs> what are you going to do are? for me, Mr Swift? <laughs> <laughs> what about this path? Well, I'm anxious to keep that because apart from anything else, these curbs are concreted in. Mm. It's a hugely practical path because it gets from the bottom of the garden to the top very easily, very cleanly. I don't want to be pithering around everywhere, mm -hmm. so I do want to keep those two hard lines. OK. How do you feel about me changing the surface, redressing it with something else? Oh, I don't mind you doing that. You can put whatever you want on the surface, but I do want to keep those two lines because, as all gardeners know, sometimes you've just got to go with what you've got.
Most gardening books are full of advice on what to plant if you've got a good garden soil, but not many will deal with this stuff, a thick, heavy, wet and sticky clay. So what do you do if your garden looks like this? Simple, you talk to a gardener who gardens on it. Derry Watkins is an American who's lived in Britain for 27 years, during which time she's become an expert plantswoman with a great love of tender perennials. Six years ago, she moved to this barn near Bath, which was converted by her architect husband, Peter. When they came to create a garden, however, she found that her biggest challenge was the condition of the soil. You hear a lot of gardeners complaining about clay soil. It's cold, it's wet, it gives their plants a really short growing season. How do you feel about it? Well, actually, I don't mind. I think clay is really hard work for gardeners and a big nuisance. I don't like it. I, every time I put my fork in and uh, try to plant a plant, I think, yuck, it's disgusting. But the plants actually love it. Once they get their feet down into that clay, they just grow their socks off. It, from my point of view, it's the best garden I've ever had. That's interesting because as you look around, all of the plants that you're growing in here don't really give away the fact that you're gardening on a clay soil. That's true, but that's partly because they're more or less raised beds, most of them. It's very steeply sloping. We did have to dig a lot of organic matter in, and we put a lot of effort into getting the soil structure kind of together. Uh, and then I try to leave it alone. You don't try to do too much with it. The plants grow really, really well. What was the site like when you moved in here? When we arrived, there was just waist-high nettles and thistles and docks, and we had no idea that it was wet down here. But as soon as we started walking around, we were over our ankles in water at this corner of the farmyard. So the very first thing we did was dig out the bottom of it to be a pond, and that collected a lot of water. That helps the water to drain away from the other places, and then it works its way down through this little channel and into these other ponds, uh, which were supposed to be ponds, but uh, they're going back to bog. We're fed up with trying to dig all the weed out of it. This seems to be a really good example of, of a, a situation where nature will overrule the gardener. So you're, you're forced to go back to the plants that would naturally be found yes. in very heavy, yes. wet conditions. Pretty much as you've got around this part of the garden with the irises and the primulas and so on, yes. which all love those really yes. damp, cool conditions. But over here, there's a completely different story. You've got plants which definitely aren't from the heavy clay soils. I mean, this, for instance, salvia discolour. Isn't lovely, that isn't amazing? It? It's the black currant sage. It smells exactly of black currants. It has got the most fantastic smell. Well, I must say, I can only keep that in there for the summer. It wouldn't survive the winter in there. And even in the summer, it probably only survives there because of the wall. And this wall is a happy accident, really. Uh, Peter made a design decision that he didn't like having this rectangular farmyard. He wanted to have lovely curving, sloping walls. So one winter, he took the stone wall and he moved it stone by stone. <laughs> down here and he made a retaining wall for this new bed and the water can swill out between and the those water stones. gets out and w i don't think we really thought about that but it turned out to be fantastic and it fits in with the landscape wonderfully it looks beautiful it is super and even standing here you get a great view of plants that are very very good for a clay soil and things like the sambucus i wouldn't hesitate to plant and even physocarpus diablo which is a very exotic looking thing what else have you done to the soil itself to try and ameliorate the conditions well, we dug in masses of organic matter. Then we covered the whole thing with Mipex, woven mulch, and covered that with two or three inches of bark. I did it because I didn't want a weed. And I don't weed. I mean, there are practically no weeds in the bulk mm. of this garden, only right around the edges. But then you've probably hit on one of the reasons why the garden is able to support plants that, that like drained conditions, because it means you as a gardener don't have to get in there and compress That's the true. clay. That's true. It may be partly because we're not walking on it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. keep off the garden. <laughs> Another way Derry's been able to counteract the effect of the heavy clay has been to cover it with a thick layer of gravel in beds around the house. I mean, you've got the most wonderful Cerinthi, which is, is that self-set just in the middle of there? Yeah, it just sewed itself. It sews itself all over the gravel. If we're not careful, we end up with a Cerinthi lawn up here. It doesn't like the rest of the garden, but it loves this place. And that, I mean, that wouldn't grow if it was too wet and too cold, would oh, it? Oh, no, absolutely not. It's a Mediterranean annual. It needs full sun, good drainage. Uh, and it just puts itself in. I think one of, the, one of the interesting things about the whole garden, though, is that you've got essentially three ways of coping with the clay. One is to dig a, a pond to allow the water to yeah. drain into the pond to try and dry the ground out around it. You've also built raised beds as well, yeah. which allows the water to percolate out. And then the gravel, I mean, it's, it's three great ideas, really, great solutions. Oh, you can grow anything if you really try. You might have to try several times, but in the end, you can get something wonderful to grow anywhere. 
Isn't it wonderful when nature keeps a promise and doesn't let you down? I told you last week that those pelagonium seeds I was sowing will be up within the week. Here they are, all ready for pricking out. I do like gardening when it moves a bit at this time of year. So what you need is a pencil or one of these plastic dibbers and then you can just ease them out. Always hold seedlings by the seed leaf, that dirty great big lump there, not by the stem underneath which is terribly fragile. And just prise that seedling from the compost, getting it out with as much root as you can and then lift it across, make a hole with your dibber or your pencil in the pot of new compost and this is just multi-purpose seed and potting compost. Ease it in and lightly firm it, not too hard, just pushing the compost around those little roots. The reason these seedlings came up so quickly is that the seeds were put in a temperature of about 75 degrees Celsius, that's about 23, didn't half shift, so it's no good now putting these youngsters into a cold greenhouse. They'll absolutely perish. This first week after pricking out is the most critical and you want to put them back in that propagating frame so it can act like a kind of nursery to grow them on. Let's pop these over here for now. If you don't want the bother of raising your own plants from seed, then in the garden centres right now you can find pots of seedlings ready grown for you. Squeaky begonias, busy lizzies, impatiens, all ready for pricking out. But you do need to keep them warm when you get them back home. They do need to go into a propagator. But the larger the plantlet, the more robust it becomes. And you can also find these plug plants. Just snap back this little mini greenhouse that they're growing in, ease them out of the gel there that these little plugs are sitting in to keep them moist in transit. And these tiny little plugs here are miniature root balls. Now what you can do with these is to plant them straight into small pots like these three inch jobs here. Take your dibber, push it up to the hole in the base and out pops that little tiny plug. You can then use the fatter end of the dibber in the pot and that plug just pops straight into it. Now keep those in a cool greenhouse until the end of May when you can plant them outside and they'll be absolutely smashing. Isn't it lovely to see a bit of growth? That's it for this week. On next week's programme, Chris Beardshaw finds big ideas for small gardens at Woolerton Old Hall. Flower grower Sarah Raven joins us to reveal everything you need to know about growing sweet peas. And Joe, what are you doing? Well, Rachel and I are coming up with some good ideas for a family garden. Well, I'm just praying that the rain holds off and I can dig that border. Whatever the weather this weekend, enjoy your garden. Ta-da!